on selling ice cream sundaes. That'll be May 29th from 11 to 1. But you gotta have a ticket. Five dollars a ticket. You can pick up your Sunday, eat it, or you can take it home and freeze it, whatever you want to do. But the uh, it goes towards the Bill Swan Food Pantry down at the community ministries. So if you want to support the food pantry, there's a way to do that and get yourself an ice cream treat in the process. Who's got tickets? Bev that Bev Lamb's got your tickets. <laughs> She's got your tickets. Um, I think that's everything this morning. 55 and over Thursday. 55 over luncheon is Thursday. Limited seating or takeout. No bone. No bones. Guaranteed. It's a guaranteed no bone. Guaranteed. No and if there is, pick it out and eat it anyway. Bone chicken bread. Bone chicken. The worship service this morning. And let us uh, pray. Gentle shepherd, leading us beyond our wants. 
leading us beyond our fears, leading us to a place of rest, where we sing the music of God's love, and feel His strength to walk through the valleys and shadows of life. Let's pray together in invitation. Lord God in heaven, today we gather as the people to worship the Holy Spirit in the earth. We celebrate your life in us and celebrate the body church. Help us to reflect your love for us and for the love we have for each other. It is with great joy that we come before you today. Joined by your spirit, thank you for your love and mercy shown to us. Thank you that we can comfort another in the same love and mercy that has comforted us. Praise be to you, our shepherd. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture. Help us today to understand more fully how you have made us to live together and serve each other. Help us to understand your plan for your body and to give you praise. Amen.
we uh, take a look at our prayers this morning, we have a lot to pray for today. Uh, we have the uh, some prayers for John and Jean Schaefer, lifting them up. Chuck Watson is in Shaky Side Hospital, and we need to pray for Chuck and uh, his recovery. And Randy Fisher is also, he's in Westmoreland Hospital, he's on the high saturation of oxygen, uh, fighting with COVID-19. Um, got uh, others, uh, Wyatt Watson, a five-month-old, uh, dealing with bacterial infection. A few other people dealing with uh, COVID, uh, Brooklyn Petula, and Connie and Roy Roker. Uh, Roy Johnson from over at Otter Pine is getting a knee replacement on Thursday. And we also like to lift up uh, sympathies for uh, uh, Jared Prinky family, uh, 43, and also Joshua Anthony's family who passed away on the 21st at age 26. Um, I know a joy that I want to lift this morning. The other day I was out and I was, came out of the church, I was doing something, Ray Keepers talking. Ray came over and said, I got to tell you something. He said, I had cancer. You know I had cancer? I said, no, Ray, I didn't know you had cancer. He says, yeah. And he says, I went into, uh, they took, you know, testing the, with the needles and everything. And he says, so I went to the oncologist thinking, well, we're going to set up our chemo and all that kind of stuff and all the things we're going to have to go through to fight this cancer. And the doctor looked at me and says, you couldn't find any cancer in you, Ray. So pray for you. So, uh, we lift that up this morning. Any others we'd like to lift? Steve, yep. I'd like to have some prayers for Josh's friend. These guys are just, they're in their 20s and they're devastated. This is, a lot of this is the first time they've been this close to losing somebody. And they're just, they need the prayers. Yeah. Any others? Yeah, I'd like to have prayers for my uncle Nick Capo. He's in the hospital in Presbyterian Hospital. Capo? I have a praise. My mom came home on Friday, so I want to thank everybody for their prayers and ask for continued prayers as she continues her to recuperate. Praise be to God. Betty Cusa. Any others? I have a praise. Sure. It was so wonderful to see the people come out to do the um, garden, especially all the youth. Um, it was yeah. great to see them back. It was. That was great to see the youth out there and working in the garden and uh, coming into the church afterwards and just sitting around the table having pizza. And, boy, that just made me feel like we're, we're getting it. You know? <laughs> we're, we're getting it. Uh, and I, Beth and I went out to eat last night and our waitress was Kennedy. So it was great to see Kennedy last night. So that was great. Any others? Let's go to our prayer time then with our prayer hymn which is, He leadeth me, O blessed thought, 128. Well, I messed up. I got Elsie all messed up. Okay, 120.
loving shepherd who leadeth us through the troubling waters of, uh, of life. We ask, O oh Lord God, that you will guide us on our journey this morning. We pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that you will hear our prayers of our hearts, that you will know the avenues that we have struggled in life, and that you have carried us through. Lord, make us aware of your constant presence with us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, we do lift up joys this morning, the joy of the garden help last Sunday, and to have all the youth and the, and the neighbors and to come together and pull some weeds and spread some mulch and, and enjoy the time of fellowship and beautifying your church. Lord, we lift up the joy of uh, Betty coming home and pray for her continued recovery and health. We lift up Ray and, and give you the glory, O Heavenly Father, for your healing hand upon him. Lord God, as we pray this morning for those who are fighting with the COVID-19, Brooklyn and Connie and Roy and, and uh, Randy, we also pray for our friends Chuck and John and Jean. We pray for uh, Roy's knee replacement. We pray for little Wyatt for his recovery. We lift up Nick to you this morning. And... Uh, we lift up all the people who are struggling with addictions and who are uh, dealing with uh, homelessness and families that are broken. <coughs> we pray for them this day, O oh Lord God. We also lift up our prayers of sympathy for Joshua Anthony's family, but also his friends as well who are young and for the first time experiencing the impact of, of losing someone. We lift up Jared Crinky's family, and we ask, O oh Lord God, that you will bless them and give them comfort to steal the storms that they are going through. Lord, there are many other prayers, prayers upon our hearts, prayers for our loved ones and for one another that we'd like to lift to you now in a moment of silence. our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the
go on. That tells you what. She's on a field trip with 45 third graders. She's going into the big city. She's going into the burg. She's heading there. They're going to go to the Tower of Learning. They're going to go uh, to the museum, the Carnegie Museum, and then finish the day with a ride on the Gateway Cliff. She's got it all mapped out. She's got the sidewalks, traffic lights all figured out. She's got the buddy system in place. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but she's not alone. She's thought this through. She's got another teacher helping her. She's got a teacher's aide coming along. That's Three of them, two parents, that's five. Five adults should handle 45 third graders. <laughs> Yet Miss Donna is not happy. See Miss Donna run. See Miss Donna tapping on her cell phone. See Miss Donna calling over the policeman. See Miss Donna visions of losing her job. What could possibly be wrong? Could be a number of things. Go on a field trip, you know, the little, little girl might got a little sick on the bus, you know, winding roads into Pittsburgh, Connellsville. She might be, uh, have a little boy who forgot to bring his lunch with him. Another little kid lost his souvenir money his mom had pinned in his pocket. Of course, there's always bathroom emergencies every 10 steps. <laughs> Truth is, the situation's worse. This situation, there's a child missing. She does a head count. It's confirmed. She started with 45, and now she's got 44. She's got to figure out, well, first of all, which kid am I missing? What's his name? Think of the Psalm 23. When we think of Psalm 23, think of that like a field trip. It's a field trip. But instead of a teacher going on the field trip, we've got a shepherd. Instead of 45 children, we got sheep. Where are the sheep? Right? Where are the sheep? And the shepherd, being a good shepherd, knows anything could possibly go wrong on the journey. Some sheep get sick. Others might be trying to wander off, so you've got to keep an eye on them. You've got to keep a close eye. Some will start bleeding like crazy because they think it's a predator. Some will do something stupid, try to avoid the shepherd. According to Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own ways. Here's the thing. When a shepherd takes the sheep from the holding pen or the fold, he's going on a field trip. And to me, you're not even really a shepherd just because you have sheep. If you keep your sheep in a fold, uh, a holding pen in a fold, you're, you're, you're a sheep farmer. But once you open the pen gates, and take them out to different pastures, now you're a shepherd. Now you're a shepherd. Research is inconclusive as to whether a third grade teacher of 45 eight-year-olds or a shepherd of 45 sheep have a harder job. But you take a look, what a shepherd has to do, he's got to feed the flock, got to provide rest, got to take them through narrow and dangerous places, got to open a first aid kit now and again, you got to feed them again, Finally, you've got to get them all home. In other words, the shepherd provides, protects, heals, and hosts. The psalmist says that the shepherd as a provider describes the situation as the sheep are without want. They lack nothing. Those opening words, we know 
pop them off the top of our head. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We don't even think about those words. We just say them. We lack nothing. Isn't there something perhaps the Lord, the shepherd missed along the way, forgot to provide, neglected to give us? But David is insisting that he lacks nothing when he's talking about the Lord as a shepherd. Well, just have to take his word for it. But what about other biblical characters? Did they say the same thing? Think of Elijah. Elijah got chased into the wilderness by Queen Jezebel. And he paused under a broom tree to complain that he alone in all of Israel had remained faithful to God. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and have killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. You think Elijah thought he was lacking nothing? How about the post-Egyptian Israelites? Free from the bondage of Egypt. Here they are out in the wilderness. They stayed there how long? Forty years. Forty years. You think they never said, well, we don't lack anything. Perhaps not. But God reminded them, although you didn't get to cross over to the Jordan because of your being so pig-headed, You still lack for nothing. God said to them, Surely the Lord your God has blessed you in all your undertakings. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. Those 40 years the Lord your God has been with you, you have lacked nothing. Deuteronomy 2 said. Take a women and men of faith over these thousands of years who have suffered for this faith. People who have, others have observed and said, surely they lack many things in their journey. Yet as the writer of Hebrews says, these people, past and present, filtered their experience through the eyes of faith. The assurance of things that are hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Sometimes our situations can be like that, kids on a field trip. I'm sure there are times when the little kids got bored. They suffered being pushed to their limits. They felt deprived. They looked at Miss Donna and didn't think of her as taking care of them, certainly not perfectly or providing everything the child needed. They probably thought, He, using the verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Does that sound like an angel? She made me walk a single file. <laughs> she made me take a nap. She made me stay with my buddy. She made me be quiet. <laughs> Folks, we're not children. We're mature believers who understand it's hard to take the long view. Only God knows what we need for the moment. That's why when we follow Jesus as our good shepherd, we do so as an act of faith. We know that we are taken care of. We know that God is providing what we need for the day, and he's doing it for our well-being. The shepherd, David said, leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths. The good shepherd provides. The shepherd's also a protector. Sheep prefer being out in the sun more than they like the shadows. 
But sometimes the shepherd has to get them through those dark places and the deep valleys of shadows that are long and dark. Sometimes the way seems dangerous. Sometimes the way is forbidden. Sometimes the way can even be deadly. It's not unusual that if you go out west in one of those western states, those big wide open states, then you might see a shepherd leading a flock down a state county, down a state or county highway and crossing them over, and cars have to come to a halt, and trucks got to come to a halt so the shepherd can get them across the road. Miss Donna had the same task. On more than one occasion, she and the teacher's aides had to gather up those 45 kids and get them across the streets, and get them across the intersections. Cars had to wait, trucks had to stop. Crossing took place only in designated areas with traffic lights, and the children were perhaps unaware what their teachers were doing. They were protecting them from harm. Because Miss Donna was alert. She had her head on a swivel, she had her eyes open, and she thought of what could possibly go wrong. What are the dangers here before she took the kids forward? When she had all those answers, she made her adjustments. This kind of attention might evoke love and appreciation. You notice in this, in the psalm, the, the pronoun changes. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You make it be to lie down. Now he changes. Now he says directly, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. He realized something special happened, so he turns to the shepherd and, the, and his words reveal a sense of amazement and appreciation. I know, I know what you're doing. You're taking care of me. You're protecting me. And I am grateful. Of course, we know it's not always green pastures. It's not always still waters. It's not always a rose garden with fragrant petals across the path. Sometimes. Valleys are dark. Sometimes the pathways that we have to travel are frightening. And we're counting on the shepherd to protect us in those times. David recognized that in the midst of the battle, in the midst of those dark pathways, in the midst of being surrounded by the predator, the shepherd is right there. The shepherd does not leave us. And the shepherd is also a healer. This might seem odd when we think of sheep. We think of, you know, how about mountain sheep? You know, they, uh, they're able to stand on little walks that are only that big around. Those sheep we got on the screen, not so much. As one guy testified to a Senate subcommittee, they are ovine ineptitude. They stumble, they fall, they bang into things. They hurt, get hurt often. Kids are like that. Take a kid on a field trip. Somebody's going to run into the other one. Somebody's going to bump into a brick wall, break a nose, or, or skin a knee. There's never been a field trip in history that there hasn't been some sort of accident along the way. Now, of course, Miss Donna and her aides are ready for that. So is the good shepherd. David says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup run overflows. <clears throat> there is no doubt a reference to a custom where people would go into a guest house and are anointed with oil as guests. But in this context, the shepherd is with sheep. He's not guests. He makes perfect sense to recall that the shepherd's weren't just guards or dietitians or pathfinders or traffic uh, officers. 
They were the doctor and the nurse for the sheep. Psalm 147 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. A shepherd had to have knowledge of medicine. He had to know how to treat <coughs> sheep injuries. Because sheep would injure. Sheep would get wounded. Sheep would be attacked by predators. Now our injuries might be our bodies, might be our souls, might be our spirits. Our suffering might be physical, might be emotional, might be psychological. We would be broken hearted, or maybe we're just broken. We might be at loose ends and not know which end is up. But the shepherd knows. The shepherd knows your wounds. And he knows what to do to heal them. He knows where to pour the oil. He knows where you hurt. And finally, the shepherd is a host. The shepherd leads the sheep home. Where the shepherd, where the shepherd will be the sort of host for the sheep. The one who is a shepherd is the beginning of the, of the psalm is now the Lord bringing him into the dwelling place at the end of the psalm. David has already alluded that the shepherd is a host because he talks about him preparing the table and anointing the oil, which gives us the image of the Eucharist of Jesus' last song. But now David is reminded the shepherd is always aware of the one thing he has to do more than anything else, and that is to bring the flock back home safely. He leads them to the fold, to the same place. And David uses this metaphor about our eternal home, our heavenly home, where we are led to the house of the Lord, where we would be, where we were going to spend eternity. The Bible says that in this eternal home, they will hunger no more. They will thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of, water, of the water of life, and God will wipe every tear. Every tear. Whatever we're facing in life, whatever perils we're up against, we can be confident. We know that the good shepherd is going to lead us to our eternal home. Now, at the beginning of my story, Miss Donna had lost a kid. Great concern. How many things was she charged with doing? Yet the one thing she knew the responsibility she had above all others was to make sure she got every kid back home. Well, they did an investigation. They started talking to the other kids and they found out it was little John. John's dad worked in Pittsburgh, got off work a little early, found the field trip group, picked his son up and took him home. Just didn't manage to tell his daughter. Needless to say, Dad got a call from Miss Donna for the field trip. <laughs> the Good Shepherd, however, never loses track of us. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And all the creditors out there, folks, he got his beady eyes on us. He's following the flock. He's waiting for the opportunity to jump in and strike. But David says in this case, goodness and mercy, not the predator, follows us all the days of our life. We are under his protection till the time when we will all dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Folks, we're going to experience pressures. We're going to experience tough times. We're going to experience hardships and heartaches and brokenness. 
but know that through everything we face, the shepherd is with us every step of our life into eternity. And with that in mind, life seems like a pretty good field trip to be on. Praise his name this morning. Amen. Our closing gift today was precious name, O House.